Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'll take a moment for the room to recenter. I hope you had a fantastic coffee, tea, conversation break after that amazing um, presentation and talk uh, this morning. Thank you all so much for being here. My name is Chris Walker, professor in the dance department and director of the Division of the Arts. And it is my honor to be here this morning to present our panel. At the Arts Division, we've been thinking a lot about the university's history, the 175 years of UW-Madison, and the role of the arts in that history. It's a history of innovation, of creativity, of investing in the possible. So I welcome you to our arts panel that is titled Bridging the Divide, the arts as a catalyst for inclusive community on this second day of our diversity forum. The panel is presented in collaboration with the Division of Equity, Education, Achievement, and the Division of the Arts. It is a pivotal annual event that we've designed to bring together a combination of faculty, staff, community members, folks from diverse backgrounds and experiences to explore the theme of the Diversity Forum that year, but with a lens through the arts. So this is an annual panel. This year's theme, of course, is Bridging the Divide, Realizing Belonging While Engaging Difference. What does this mean for the arts? We're privileged to have a panel of distinguished presenters and while their specific experiences may vary, it is their collective dedication to the transformative role of the arts in creating a sense of belonging and inclusivity, and, and inclusivity is what unites them on this panel. I'm going to introduce each presenter. They will talk, give a short micro talk on their work, and following each presenter I'll introduce the next, at the end of which we'll engage in a short discussion among each other, and then we will welcome questions from the audience. Their insights will inspire us to uncover the ways in which artful connections can help us bridge the gap between access and a true sense of belonging in our communities. So without further ado, our first presenter is Christy Clark Pujara. Dr. Clark Pujara is a historian whose research focuses on the experiences of black people in the French and British North America in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. She's particularly interested in retrieving the hidden and in explore histories of African Americans in areas that historians have not sufficiently examined, small towns and cities in the North and the Midwest. She contends that the full dimensions of, Af of African American and American experience cannot be appreciated without reference to how black people managed their lives in places where they were few. Please welcome Dr. Christy Clark Pujara. Thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I want to be really brief so we have uh, time for discussion. I would like to share just a couple of slides about how I engage art. Thank you. Okay. So I am what historians call an early Americanist. And so that basically means that I am really interested in history of the British and French colonial periods and the early American Republic before 1860. I always jokingly tell folks I get a little bit hazy in the 20th century because I spend most of my time in the 17th and 18th century. In that really early period, there are very few visuals for historians to engage with. Um, we're primarily dealing with laws, letters, diaries, newspaper ads, and things like that. So rarely do I get to see an image of a person that I am writing about, thinking about um, in my quest to understand the creation 
of what becomes the United States. Um, I have recently been privileged to write an introductory article for um, a book that actually is coming out this month. It's not quite out yet. It's called Unnamed Figures, Black Presence and Absence in Early um, American North. You see both free and enslaved black people showing up in the portraits of prominent white families in places like New England. And for the most part, they're not talked about, right? They're a background figure. Um, they're an appendage of a white family. And really trying to think about what was their life and experience like in the very few pictures we have of them and how they are portrayed by those white artists with those white families who chose to include them in a portrait of their family, right? This is a very kind of elite activity, tells us about that space and time. And so this is an example of that. In these portraits, it's primarily domestics, right? Enslaved people that served in the house. Um, and they're often well-dressed in the pictures uh, because they are appearing with the family at their best, sometimes at a table, um, often posed in service. And so thinking about what those images can tell us about that place and time. I also use art as a primary source in my current book project, which is about black people and what becomes Wisconsin from the French colonial period in the 1720s through the American Civil War. So this is a, these are images of Fort Crawford in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin. Forts were places of and sites of slavery in the Midwest as it was being formed. So the United States is born a empire, a slaveholding republic with the Northwest Territories. Wisconsin is carved out of the Northwest Territories. And forts were how the US government established control, physical control of those places, displacing and forcefully removing Native Americans. We, of course, are on Ho-Chunk land right now, um, who encountered several, endured several removals and kept coming back and are here today, still trying to protect the land and the waterways. And forts are the sites of slavery because they are the expression of colonialism and control. But they also are spaces where military officers are. And military officers were afforded certain perks. And one of those perks was to be reimbursed for the use of enslaved people that they held in bondage. Um, probably one of the most famous people uh, at Fort Crawford as an officer um, is um, going to be Jefferson Davis, who becomes president of the Confederacy. But his first post was at Fort Crawford, and he brought enslaved people with him, and the US federal government reimbursed him for that. Um, there were upwards of two dozen enslaved people in and around Fort Crawford. And I think about what it meant to be enslaved in a space where, one, it's an expression of American colonialism. You're surrounded primarily by armed white men. I very rarely get to look into the faces of people that I write about and talk about. This is America Jenkins. She was enslaved in Sassinawa, Wisconsin. Uh, she was freed and made her way to Pleasant Ridge, which was a free black homestead in Wisconsin, about an hour and a half from here. And she is sitting for her own portrait, right? And I've been learning from folks like Chris to pay attention to their bodies, right? Their posture. And I particularly love these images of black people because it's how they were presenting themselves to the world. And I just wanna quickly show you a couple of more pictures um, of black folks in what becomes Wisconsin. This is Carolyn Shepard. She takes this picture um, 
when she is meeting her husband after the Civil War. Um, and you can see how proud she is, right? How her shoulders are back. She has on very nice jewelry. She probably spent a long time making sure that dress looked perfect. This is Isaac Shepard, Ella Shepard, Eliza Shepard, and Emily Shepard. Isaac Shepard um, was born in bondage, becomes a free man, and one of the most successful homesteaders at Pleasant Ridge in Wisconsin. And he is pictured with his three daughters. Sometimes when I show these images to students, they say, why aren't they smiling, right? You rarely see pictures of folks in the 19th century smiling, especially black folks, because they are portraying an, an image of dignity, right, of seriousness. And pictures were a big deal. Right, and I think we forget that because we all have these amazing cameras in our pockets now, but you had to like do lab experiments to get a picture and you had to carry around pounds of equipment and liquids to get a picture. Like it was a big deal. Um, it was something um, that was not common, something that you would treasure. This is Ezekiel Gillespie. Ezekiel Gillespie um, suit is responsible for Wisconsin becoming the first state in which black men can vote unrestricted. He sued for the right uh, to vote in 1866. Um, there's a picture of him as a young man and a picture of him in his middle age. He is sitting for both of these portraits. And finally, I wanna share art as a practice. And this is something that I'm just becoming uh, familiar with and learning. Uh, I have the pleasure of sitting on the UW Odyssey board and lecturing in some UW Odyssey classes. If you don't know what UW Odyssey is, I really encourage you to Google it. I think it is one of the best expressions of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, giving people an opportunity um, to find an entry point into this often exclusionary space. Uh, but this was re-emancipation, which was hosted by the Chazen and an experience that really changed how I looked at art and my own work. Um, and one of the activities that was done was a quilt that was done with the UW Odyssey class for re-emancipation. How do we reimagine um, emancipation? And I'm going to pass it on to the next panelist. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you so very much. Um, well, I had the opportunity to sit with these slides, and one of the things I found myself doing as a dance artist was embodying the postures in the photographs and the sense of power and pride and presence um, that I felt was phenomenal. Thank you so much for the work that you do in bridging the divide between time, between space, between understanding, um, a sense of pride stands firm in my body as I myself try to get an understanding of my own indigenizing process as I have been in Wisconsin for 18 years. Thank you for this amazing work. Our next speaker is Kiba Freeman. Kiba is a full-time stay-at-home dad and professional artist located in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. In 2016, he started Kiba Freeman Art, LLC. He currently specializes in creating with spray paint and paint markers on everything from canvas to exterior walls of varying sizes. He tends to create landscapes, explore space, dabble in abstractions and self-portraits through his creative practice. I first saw his work at the opening of a mural um, downtown this summer. And it was one of those murals that I looked at and suddenly I made sense here. Suddenly the landscape made sense here. Suddenly I wasn't yearning for mountains because there was something about how the flat plains of this space was represented in that work that um, I realized, oh, I've been here long enough. This makes sense to me. Please welcome artist Kiba Freeman. Hello, hello. Thanks for the introduction. It makes me sound super cool. <laughs> um, Keeper Freeman, hey, that's, that's me. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a full-time stay-at-home dad, and I always mention that first because it's my full-time job, and I take pride in what I do. Um, I love my family, I love my children, and everything I do is 
both for me and for them. Um, and that's, that feeds my creative practice. Um, real quick, I'm originally from a small town in Illinois, right off the lake. You probably have heard of it. It's called Chicago. Um, <laughs> people tend to pass through it, fly different places. Um, I spent the first half of my life there, and then I was recruited to come to school at um, UW-Stevens Point, um, which at the time, I was sure I was never going to go to a place called Stevens Point because who is Stevens Point and why would I go there? Um, I've always been an artist, and I just assumed I would go to some sort of art school, um, be surrounded by local creative folks, uh, and be immersed in that kind of situation. After visiting Stevens Point, I fell in love with the area. And so I've been in Stevens Point since 2009. I achieved my um, Bachelor's of Fine Arts there, and have been growing my business and my family. My art practice has evolved a lot over the years. As an undergrad, I mostly um, focused on film photography and printmaking, which are very archaic art styles. Um, but I love the process. I'm a very process-oriented artist, and those things are most interesting to me. Um, if you were to ask me while I was an undergrad about painting or landscapes, I would have laughed because I hated painting. I did not like it at all. Um, it didn't make sense to me. Um, it wasn't until a study abroad trip that something else started to click when it comes to painting. Uh, I studied abroad in Italy, and while there, I came across spray paint art as an art form and a style, mostly done by street artists to um, do things to sell to tourists, touristy things, space scenes, superheroes, that sort of stuff, the Colosseum. All my classmates were super interested in, I want to buy all of these things. These are super cool. How can I fit it all this in my suitcase? I was way more interested in the process. Remember, I'm a process-oriented artist. And so I will go back over and over while in Rome and watch these guys that I can barely communicate with because I knew a little bit of Italian and I knew some English, and we tried to chop it up using art. Um, but the process made sense to me. I figured when I get back home, I'll, I'm going to try this. But it wasn't until about a year later that I actually got to do it because, um, as you, some of you may know, your last year of school gets kind of busy. I had senior capstone classes, I was working full time, I was just trying to figure out what else to do um, with my life as a student and post-graduation. Um, I started using spray paint and I was just playing around. I didn't plan to make it my art form. It was just something I wanted to do. To, it was interesting to me. And I would just play around with a lot of different space scenes and, and try to figure out how else can I make this work in my favor? What else can I do to manipulate this process? And I know what everyone's thinking right away when we think of spray paint. No, I've never painted a train car. <laughs> I always answer that question because um, people tend to ask me, and I always just joke and say, well, no one's paid me to do it yet, so I haven't done it yet. <laughs> the way I see it is if you have a skill that you've worked and developed on, you should get paid for your skill. Um, so no, I won't paint those sorts of things. Um, I also try to do whatever I can to stay away from the law, and that seems like an easy way to kind of attract too much attention. <laughs> Um, this is the mural that Chris was uh, speaking on earlier that's located downtown on um, Gorham and State. This is a fantastic project for me to do. It blends two things that I'm super interested in, science and teaching, especially my, younger, my children and people around me, and art, and using art to bridge kind of that gap when it comes to science and creative fields, because so many people think it's very different. I, I know that it's not. I mentioned that I did film photography, and that's just science, really. You gotta use chemistry. You gotta put chemicals together. The, the paper has to, the emotion has to get so much exp um, exposure to light in order to, to make the images work. And you can manipulate that by changing the amount of time that is exposed or changing the amount of time that you're um, processing each part of the process. Um, so science and art, in my mind, go hand in hand. So this project was right up my alley. Um, my daughter Soraya was born in 2018. Before she was born, I did my first two murals. After she was born, I realized that I needed to do more murals and make sure that she was in them. I wanted her to be able to go anywhere in Wisconsin and know that, hey, they let my dad paint this image of me here. Clearly, I'm welcome here. I want her and other little girls and other kids to, to feel welcome wherever they go, wherever I make artwork. And so that became my bigger purpose and mission, whereas before I was just making art because I just needed to. It's just something that made sense to me. 
Over the last several years, I've done murals throughout Wisconsin, and I'm planning to branch out into the larger Midwest and then the nation and who knows the world. Um, we'll see how far I can get. But I try to include my daughter in as many things as I can. Um, and I want her to be able to see herself and know that, hey, that's me. Or someone else can say, hey, that looks kind of like me. I've had that hairstyle. I know a cousin that has that hairstyle. I kind of like that hairstyle. I want to I try that, you know. Um, and, and that's become very important to me. So a lot of the images you'll see that I'm clicking through here includes my daughter in some capacity. And sometimes I include other kids as well. But most of the time, it's my daughter. She knows it's her. I know it's her. But if you see it out in public, you might see someone else. You might see your cousin, your friend. You might see yourself when you had a little bit more hair. <laughs> you know, it, I want people to see themselves, and that's also why I see, use silhouettes. Um, I don't want to speak too much more, but I do want to mention that my last mural that I recently completed is almost kind of a full circle moment for me. This mural here is located in the town of Rome in Wisconsin. Now, I started my spray paint journey in Rome, Italy. So it's kind of a full circle, but not really. <laughs> <laughs> it will become a real full circle once I do a mural in Italy. And so that's to come. If you're ever in, throughout Wisconsin, you'll see my work, um, and hopefully you get to see a little bit more of yourself and feel welcome and know that you belong there. Thank you for sharing your art. Thank you for telling your story. Thank you for creating images of young, biracial, black, mixed, diverse um, representations of young people across Wisconsin. It makes me smile every time I see her silhouette, and I know it's her, so um, I feel all special. Our next presenter is uh, Jamalik. Artistic and Executive Director at Madison Ballet. Now, I want you to recognize those are two very different jobs that I just, I didn't realize until I read it. That's two jobs you have, sir. Um, and that's, that's the world of where the artist has to also learn to be an entrepreneur. So it's not uncommon for an Artistic Executive Director to exist, because it means that the person has to make the artistic decisions, probably creative decisions, but also have to raise the funds, hire the people, do all the things. <laughs> the 2023-24 season of Madison Ballet marks his second season as Artistic Director. He is a 25-year career as the performing artist dancing with Oakland Ballet, Charlotte Ballet, Ballet X, and Ballet Hispanico in New York City, to name a few. Jamalek is an award-winning, evolving choreographer from Harlem, New York, who creates works based on real-life experiences. He is minding the gap between the elite perception of ballet and what he views as the reality of ballet in the modern world. I would like you to help me welcome Jamalek to uh, present on his work at Madison Ballet. That's me. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. What am I doing here? I don't know, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, yeah, so thank you. Um, yeah, my name is John Malik. I am from Harlem, New York City, New York. I have been here since July of 2022. Um, my journey is basically, I am a walking representation of the power of diversifying any field that has been predominantly white. And I am in the ballet field. And in the performing arts, oh, thank you. In the performing arts, um, it's one of the least diversified performing arts in America, unfortunately, or in the world, actually. Um, I grew up in the 70s and 80s, a Michael Jackson baby. I was enthralled by everything that he did, dance-wise, creatively, entertainment-wise, and when I saw Thriller, that's when I knew I was like, I wanna be Michael Jackson. <laughs> um, in all its forms and ways possible. So I literally um, watched Thriller and um, learned the dance in like one watch and literally performed it every single day um, outside of my house in, in Harlem to the point that my neighbors 
begged my parents to take me somewhere to learn some other dance forms <laughs> so I could stop doing Thriller. They said, you can go teach them the Irish jigs, you can go teach them African dance. They didn't ever mention ballet. But, um, so they eventually took me to an African dance class, which I loved, I thought it was great. It taught me a lot about uh, community and percussive rhythms and um, joy and everything like that. But it wasn't the same feeling that I had doing Thriller. So let's fast forward years later, because I could go on and on and on. Um, my aunt in Cleveland, Ohio, I was visiting my grandparents and she took me to a performance of Cleveland Ballet. Just randomly, she worked for Cleveland Clinic Foundation and they gave her free tickets. And she took me to a performance. I had to be about 11 or 12 years old. And I sat there in that theater and I saw ballet for the second time. And it was the Nutcracker. And in 15, 20 minutes into the ballet, a man walks on stage who looks exactly like me. I almost lost my, my mind. Because I was convinced, I had seen Giselle when I was about six and loved it. I was enthralled with the beauty, the storytelling, the make-believe, the fairy tale, the dancing, everything about it was just amazing. And there were no one that looked like me up there on that stage, so I never thought about it as a career. I just thought, I love it, it ain't for me. What can I do? So sitting there at that Cleveland Ballet performance and watching this young man who looks exactly like, I should have put his picture on a slide, he, looked, he looks exactly like me, his name was Ramon Thiele, and when he walked out there in those white tights and white ballet shoes and that tunic and stood there with such pride and in fifth position, our ballet terminology, I just was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is how, this is how I'm gonna make my life. This is going to be my life. And thus began my journey of my life in ballet. Um, I say I'm a walking representation of the power of diversity because I grew up in an all-black neighborhood with an all-black high school and all-black elementary school. My family is completely black. My friends are completely black. My world was completely black, which is nice. But in going to a ballet school, I was then surrounded by a multitude of people from different backgrounds and areas. And unfortunately, I was one of only two black kids in the ballet school. But the great thing about that is my teachers had a vision and they saw potential in me and gave me a full scholarship because it cost roughly $190,000 for you to train to become a ballet dancer. That is starting at the age of six, seven, going until you're around 16, 17, 18. That's including your full year of schooling, summer tuitions, your dance clothes, everything needed to really become a professional dancer. And these two people who had never trained a black person in their life decided that I was worthy of a scholarship for the rest of my life as long as they had a school. And I'm forever grateful for that because it gave me an opportunity not only to learn ballet, but to also immerse myself into a world of other people. So what I really wanna talk about briefly today is about reflecting communities. I have a true and tr a strong stance that if your arts organizations, for me in ballet, do not represent the communities that they serve, get rid of them. Because there is no reason that any arts organization, any performing arts entity, should not reflect the world that we live in. And I don't know if anyone has been to any part of the world where there is an insular amount of people that don't have diversity. I have yet to find that. And I've been to Antarctica, <laughs> where I met a black man. So you can't tell me that there's, you know, there's diversity everywhere, so we're never gonna be in a place of, of non-diversity. So your arts communities and your arts organizations have to reflect that, and if they don't, like I say, get rid of them. Especially when you're paying tax dollars and your tax dollars are going towards that diversity and inclusion and they're not doing the work. So, what I did, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin. Never been here in my life. Thanks, great to be here. I've never seen this many black people in my life. Nice to see you. But with that, my first question was, where is the communities? Where are the communities? So this school right here is the Lucier Center, which is around the corner from Madison Ballet. Madison Ballet has been around for 42 years. This is the first time they have connected with this community center. Wow. Building a diverse future. It's not really that hard. <laughs> 
We, I have been on panels and discussions about diversity and inclusion since I started in Cleveland. I started in Cleveland Ballet, by the way. I got into the company at 16. And I have been on diversity panels and discussions since 16. I am almost 53 years old and fr on Friday. I'll be 53. And thank you. And I'm still on panels talking about this. When are we going to change it? It's not really that hard. As I said, Madison Ballet's been here 42 years. There's a black and brown community center around the corner. Knock on the door. That's what I did. Literally went around the corner, knocked on the door, asked to speak to the executive director, and started a conversation. I had a program started within three months. Wasn't that hard. Had, thanks. I had about 52 kids of all races attend these classes. We were there for three weeks, and the fear was they would come to the first class and they wouldn't come to any others. Perfect attendance for the full three weeks. These kids were so engaged and so involved and so interested in what we were teaching them. None of them had ever taken ballet or dance before. So that was an honor for me to be able to give them this exposure. So it's really not that hard if you just reach out, you know. Um, at Madison Ballet, this is my company. As you see, there are people of every race that you could think of. There are people from Brazil, uh, Philippines, Ohio, Texas, uh, Thailand. They're, they're from everywhere. Canada, there's from everywhere. I'm always like, it's not that hard. Always asking the question also, how do we move ballet into the 21st century? We're here. We can't move it into something that we're already almost out of. We have to just do it. We have to just do the work, bridge the diversity. Um, this is my main point here, is really utilizing your connections. And that brings me back to the beginning of the story. My world was black. When I went to a ballet school, my world expanded. Those connections I have never forgotten. I am still friends with everybody I went to ballet school with at 11 years old. These are some of those people. Ucha Maria Sorzano is one of the first choreographers I commissioned here last year to create a ballet for Madison Ballet. She is a Trinidadian. Um, ballet choreographer. We met at the Dance Theater of Harlem at 13 years old. That's 40 years ago. This is my first time working with her in this capacity. That connection has never been lost. Aaliyah was one of the first dancers, Aaliyah Cachet, she just choreographed a beautiful ballet for this season. She was one of the first dancers to give me a chance to create ballets on her at the Ailey School when we were around 17 or 18. And we have been in connection for over 20 years. Bring her in. Marika Bruss Brussel, I met in 2019. I did an artist residency at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. She is a white Jewish woman from upstate New York. That's another connection. It's not that hard. You just have to open up your mind, open up your possibilities, open up your hand, shake it. Hi, how you doing? Met him today, new connection. Met her today, new connection. Met her months ago, new connection. These are people that I'm now connected with that I can bring into a setting to say, hey, how can we diversify this thing I'm doing over here at ballet? It's not really that hard. We just make it harder than it is. Um, let's see, do I have anything else to say? Not really, I'm more interested in conversation and questions, but it just, that, that gives you a pretty good rundown, I hope, of like what I'm here to do, what my mission is, and what we're trying to accomplish over at Madison Ballet. Thank you. Uh, you heard it, you heard it, you heard it from Jamalik. If you haven't been to one of Madison Ballet's concerts, I encourage you to get there early and prepared for the stand-up comedy show that would precede the dancing. Thank you for your amazing work beyond your humor because you do use humor to um, assuage sometimes the weight of what you're delivering. Um, so thank you for your grace and thank you for your work. Um, the man is saying just step forward and do the thing. If you believe in it, step forward, make connections, do the thing. Um, our final presenter um, is Christina Martin Wright, who is the executive director of Arts for All Wisconsin since 2018. Christina holds an MFA in directing and dramaturgy from the Chicago College of the Performing Arts at Roosevelt University and an undergraduate degree in performance from Northern Michigan University. She's one of the founders of Madison Stage Q Theater and has been an active member of the arts community for over two decades. 
Christina has nonprofit leadership, fundraising, and external relations experience with some of the area's most vibrant organizations and events, including the Wisconsin Film Festival, Children's Theater of Madison, and Madison's Children's Museum. I'm excited to hear about Christina's work at Arts for All Wisconsin. Please welcome Christina Martin Wright. Thank you so much, Chris, for, for including me in this panel. And it's, it's been such a pleasure to hear about, about my, um, my pan <laughs> fellow panelists' uh, work. So I am with Arts for All Wisconsin. Um, some of you may have heard of us as Very Special Arts Wisconsin, or VSA, because we were founded nearly four decades ago as a program out of the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C., um, through a program that is now known as VSA International. Um, though our name has changed, our mission has not. It, this, um, the mission um, that you may see on the screen is, has been our mission for this entire time. And we work with people with disabilities, children and adults from age three through the end of life through the arts. And that includes um, all, all arts disciplines. We are located here in Madison, Wisconsin. That has been our home through our our existence, um, but our work is um, statewide. And so to learn about our values and the impact that we have on communities, I'm going to explain our core programs. We work in schools and community centers throughout the state um, in conjunction with site directors and classroom teachers to develop artist-in-residence programs where we interact um, with classrooms that have a large percentage of students with disabilities or residents with disabilities, but we teach to the entire classroom so that people with disabilities can learn and create alongside of their peers. So when we enter the classroom, we really have our focus on the individuals with special needs or, dis or who identify or have been identified as having a disability of any kind, but we really teach to the whole, the, to the whole group. We also hold, we design and facilitate our own classes in the arts. We do that primarily in Madison um, because that is where the, the core, our core staff exists. Um, and these classes are again for people three years old through adults in all different art forms. And all of our classes and programs are taught by professionals in their field. Um, one thing that is true all the way across our staff is that um, that each individual teaching artist or choir director or program director is um, very proficient and excellent in their particular art form, and they also have a high capacity for respect and empathy and compassion and patience and a love of discovery. We also have choir programs. We have a choir here in Madison, one in um, Wisconsin Rapids, Appleton, Oshkosh, and Milwaukee. At different times over the last 38 years, we've had choir programs in, in other cities and communities, but right now we have five active choirs. These choirs are made up of people um, typically 16 years old and up. We have some choir members who have been um, with their particular community choir for 20 years. Um, these choirs serve as places to explore different music forms, um, to come together. Some, some choirs are more than vocal choirs. Um, some um, incorporate percussion, piano, guitar, um, and, and they all perform for their communities as well. There's typically two public um, choir performances, one usually around the holidays, and depending on the community that the choir is in, it may be called a Christmas concert. 
but we let that, um, we let the choir concerts and the choir culture reflect the community and the choir members too. Um, you can see, um, or if, if you're able to see, the one of the pictures in the slide show is, um, was taken last year at the, the tree lighting ceremony at Governor Evers um, mansion. Um, and um, our choir performed for several hundreds, the Madison Choir performed for several hundred participants or spectators. Um, one of the things that, um, when we talk about bridging um, the divide between, between um, um, different communities, um, one of the things that I really enjoy about um, being executive director is that I get to go to all of these different events, and sometimes our choirs will perform the national anthem. They'll sing and sign the national anthem before um, a, a ball game or a soccer match, and and I I'm in the crowd for these and for the tree lighting ceremony last year, and. To be perfectly honest, when the choirs begin, I tend to see a lot of discomfort in the crowd. And some, some laughter, some snickering, people will you know, look at each other. And, and it's interesting to me to see other people calm that nervousness, that discomfort, um, and, and even you know, give the chin, chin like, shh. Let's, let's listen. And by the end of the first song, I see people transformed through audiences. Um, they're, I, I don't know if, if this is a step too far, but, but I witness heart softening. Okay, and, and um, that's just one of my favorite things about the choir, choir programs, because so much of what we do, um, it happens in classrooms and not in performances. So it's, it's a great opportunity to, to see and to, to bear witness to the power of, of the arts and inclusion. Um, also, we have an annual um, activity. It's called Creative Power. It's a, um, a, a competition, if you will, um, and where we have an open call for art and call for poetry that we um, make throughout the state. So we invite people five years old and up to submit two, up to two pieces of original work, uh, visual artwork and poetry, sometimes based on a theme. The poetry is based on a theme, but this year it's not. And it's a free, it's free to participate. Um, and we invite people to submit their work to us. And then we exhibit everything. Um, we do that in, in a public forum, um, in an area that is accessible, physically accessible, and financially accessible. We celebrate all of the entries, and then we invite um, jurors, um, people in the, in the community who are experts in the field, um, to come in and adjudicate the art and the poetry. And then um, pieces are... are Outstanding pieces are chosen and receive awards, monetary awards, but also these the Creative Power award-winning pieces enter collections that tour the state of Wisconsin, both in person and virtually, to increase accessibility. Uh, but we then celebrate all of the winners and you know runners up through our merit awards and in a public forum. So um, one of the things that is, um, is very special to me as a mother of a, um, of a child with a disability, um, I enjoy seeing the families who participate in this, in this award ceremony and, and how much it means to them and of course to the award recipient to be honored in such a way in a public Forum. And we honor people through, um, there's always creative power winners um, throughout the state, too. So um, coming to Madison in our state capital to be honored um, is, um, is a special experience. 
that's the way that we meet many artists. Um, many of our program, I think our one of the programs that we're most known for as an organization is our visual art program. And through the call, our annual call through art, call for art, that's one of the ways that we have engaged with um, professional and amateur artists throughout the state. Um, we have exhibitions, not only the Creative Power Exhibition, but many other exhibitions and curated collections that we help to get into museums and public spaces, private spaces as well. And we sell art on behalf of artists with disabilities. 70% of every sale goes directly back to the artist. We work with artists who are also represented in other, other forums um, and, and artists who are able to run their own studios and, and handle their own sales um, because that's in, in their skill set or they, they have that, that ability or the means to do so. But the majority of the artists that we represent through sales throughout the state and at Art Fair on the Square every year um, don't have that that ability. Um, so it's it's really important to us that we are not only elevating the work of artists who would not otherwise be seen, um, people who would not otherwise purchase their work, um, but that we're adding to the creative or the the a creative creative economy. In this, in this state as well. Um, we have artists who, who supplement their income. Um, many of the artists that we work with are on disability um, and they don't have other forms of income. We have worked with artists who have asked for, for their 70% to come back to them in the form of gift cards for grocery stores because they're unable to have another income because of the conditions of their state um, federal and federal aid. Um, so that has been that has been an education for me as well. Um, we also work in the area of professional development. We teach teachers, we teach caregivers um, and and so we we serve to share the knowledge that we have gained um, through our, our many years of doing this work um, to others to make their places of business, their classrooms, their households more inclusive through learning adapt, um, adaptations um, and different ways to, to reach people. I'd like to, to make sure that I mention this um, um, in, in this slide, one of the slide photos is a picture of, of a recent um, workshop that we did for, for teachers in Wisconsin. Um, and they're gathered around a table working on an art project together. Um, there are bandanas worn on uh, one of the, the uh, participants has a bandana around his head. Two of them have bandanas around their eyes. I want to be very clear that we were not asking the participants to simulate blindness. That is not the intent. Um, and, and I just wanted to make that very clear. It was to experience, to, um, to deaden a sense, uh, one of the senses, um, and, and change the relationship that the individual had with their environment. We also have some very specific classes and programs that address more specific populations. Now when we say arts for all, all is a really big word and the majority of our, of our classes and programs um, are not specific to different segments of society or segmented disability. Um, there are some exceptions. One is our Veterans Arts Studio. This was created about 10 years ago in conjunction with uh, with vet centers in Madison, Wausau, and Green Bay. And th this program is in visual art and creative writing. And it includes a um, crisis counselor or a um, 
therapist, a readjustment therapist from the vet center because there are very, spe um, very specific needs of the participants involved in this program. And then also, we are the, currently the Dane County representative uh, or SPARC provider. SPARC is an art, arts and culture program for people with Alzheimer's and dementia and their care partners. Um, many of our programs do work with people with memory loss, um, traumatic brain injury, developmental uh, disabilities. So we are, are, I would say, expert if I may, in uh, working with people um, uh, with these considerations in mind. Um, what makes Spark very unique is that this program is delivered to both the person, the individual experiencing memory loss and their care partners. That could be a spouse, um, a child, um, or a, you know, hired staff, or even a neighbor. Um, so, that we do, and also this is a free program. All, our VET program is also free. So as I said, we are a statewide organization. This, the two maps um, in this slide represent Wisconsin and the different communities that we are currently working in. Um, and something that, that I really want to, um, to, to address is that as we think about the Wisconsin idea and, and our role in, in that, in our statewide work, each of these communities and all of those that aren't represented, that we're not in yet, um, they have their own atmosphere, their own environment, their own um, culture, and it's very important that we remember that as a Madison-based organization, that we are not imposing ourselves and our ideals necessarily into those communities. That we may be in, in Madison and at the UW talking a lot about language and how we talk about um, people with disabilities or disabled artists and where we put the words and what are the words and, and honoring people's preferences. I think that's very, very important. Something that we are keeping in mind is that individuals in some of these communities are, are excited about the fact that they're no longer using the R word. You know, so it, there's, there's um, a lot of gray area in the work that we do, too. So, I just wanted to mention that. Thanks. It is very easy, and I know there are people in this room who, does not, who, do not, who do not make that mistake, but it's very easy to think about diversity, and we think about race, and we think about ethnicity, and we think about, but we often don't think about the diverse range of, of, of disabilities that may prevent someone from accessing something that we think of as normal. And that may be obvious in that it presents itself and is diagnosed, or it may be very hidden. So as we think about this work, um, I want to thank you so much for uh, bringing this very important work that you do with these diverse communities and the role of the arts in doing that work. I've asked the panelists to think a little bit about what they've heard from each other and that our first question or conversation on the stage will be among um, themselves. So what was one thing that jumped out for, me, for you from another pre presentation that you'd like to either highlight, ask a deeper question about, or respond? Go ahead, Kiba. Mic check. All right. So I've been thinking about this, and I heard John Malik say that he was inspired when he saw someone that looked like him doing something that he hadn't even considered doing. And this, this idea has been on my mind for quite a while now because I, I kind of wonder how I got into the position I am I'm in as an artist um, full time, and I have never, had never seen a full-time or met a full-time artist growing up, let alone a full-time black male artist. Um, and so that idea isn't lost on me at all. And I try to purposefully, there we go, 
purposefully um, be there, be in attendance and be present when it comes to being in my community because I know how much of an asset I would have been to myself had I been, had I been able to meet me. And so being able to meet a full-time artist and see that, hey, this is a possibility, but also a full-time artist that's, uh, that's enthralled with his kids and, and being involved in the community. And not necessarily, I'm not trying to change the world per se, but changing our world and our community. So I, I, that resonated with me because it, it literally has been on my mind for the last several years and how I can fill that role successfully, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question of, of representation as well. Did you have a response, Ja? Or? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Go ahead, Chrissy. Uh, I had a, I had a similar. Really, Go ahead. I think my mic is working. Can you hear me? OK. Um, no, I didn't really have a response to that just because I just, I know how important it is. And it's, you know, and that's, you, you hit on one key thing. It's like when we're in these positions now, it is our responsibility to show up as a representation. We can't just make it and say, great, I made it. Ta-da, I'm done. No, it's like now the work really begins, you know, because I don't want to, I don't want to be the only one. I don't want to be the only, there are 275 ballet companies in America there are four black artistic directors. I'm one of them. I don't want to be one of four. I want to be one of many. And I, um, I didn't even talk about women because that's a whole other thing. But I think the point, you didn't ask me yet, but I'm going to talk about it. For her, <laughs> for Christine, what, what gets me is that what you hit on is that I, I live in this world of blackness in this white ballet world. So that's what I wake up thinking about daily. That's what I go to bed thinking about daily. And I love to be among these kind of conversations where I am forced to think about other people with disabilities, women, gays, everybody. You know, it's, and, and that's really diversity. You know, it's not just about race, as you said. So that was my takeaway, and that was my point, just to show up. Thank you. Um, I had a similar response to thinking about representation. Um, if I had a nickel for the looks of shock that I get every time I say that, you know, I specialize in Northern slavery or that I'm writing a book about black people in Wisconsin before the Civil War, um, they don't think they were here. And that's why I try to show the pictures of these people whenever I can, right? They were here. Um, and what that erasure means are thinking about black people in spaces like Wisconsin only existing in three metro areas, Madison, Milwaukee, and Racine, um, and how history and exclusion uh, was, you know, that, that created that situation. Um, the black population in Wisconsin before the Civil War was rural. After the Civil War, it becomes increasingly urban because they were ran out and thinking about what that means for us today. Um, and also, when we're thinking about diversity, I'm always thinking about the multi-layered. Uh, so I have learned so much from some of my colleagues in gender and women's studies, like um, Sammy Shock, who wrote a Black Disability Politics, because you run into so much disability when you are talking about marginalized people, especially enslaved people. They were living with profound physical um, disabilities as a result of the kinds of work they were forced to do, like mine led in the territories of Wisconsin in January. Um, it, it, led to, it led to profound disability. And thinking about what that meant for them in that space before that language was part of our lexicon. Um, and so that people aren't one thing, they're often many things. I think that one, one of the things that struck me as well is, is representation and the ability to just go and knock on a door and say, hey, I'm here and you're here, why don't we do something together? Um, it's so important and is central to the way that, to the way that I work. Um, but also understanding my, my privilege, I mean, not only as a, as a white person, but as a person who it has the luxury of being married to someone with health insurance. Um, when I came, when I was asked to be executive director of then VSA Wisconsin, 
one of my conditions to, to take the, the job, which I desperately wanted because I love this organization, was um, that, that I would have the board's backing to um, ensure health insurance and, and to, to, it was a position with no benefits. And, and I said, until this organization offers benefits, you're gonna get the same type of person in leadership positions and in your full-time positions, someone who doesn't need health insurance because their partner has it. And so that was one of the first changes. But then also in saying no conversation about us without us. Um, that's a, a lovely thing to say and it's a lovely intention, um, but it's a lot harder to do than I thought. Um, we have increased the number of people of color on our, on our staff and um, on our board, board of directors as well, but also we've increased the number of people um, who identify as having a disability on staff and on our board as well. But that does not come without um, ramifications, too. There's cost involved with that. There's cost involved in providing accommodations, modifying expectations and timelines. You know, we, we are, um, in the arts and in, I think in all industries, very driven by expectation and productivity. Um, that changes when you introduce people with who have different needs. So, Thank you. yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have any additional comments to what you heard from each other? Um, I think that me and you should have a conversation eventually because another thing that's been weighing heavily on me is how we're represented in the arts, um, black people in general, and then historical figures. And I, I typically, for the longest time, I shied away from um, doing people and portraits, but I think it's kind of almost my duty to help show us and, and paint us and, and be a part of that process so that people can know more about our history and more about what we did, not just right now in 2023 or 2024, but all of our accomplishments. So future conversation. Absolutely, because <laughs> I have all kinds of ideas. One thing that I really love about some of the work I do is the things that I encounter. And when I begin to study black people and what becomes Wisconsin, I really fell in love with the Pleasant Ridge community that was established in um, 1850. And one thing that they did was they built a dance hall. And the women had a autumn leaf poetry club, right? Like these were people who were living the fullness of their life. They weren't just surviving out in the hinterlands of Wisconsin, they were thriving. And they were having dances and they were writing poetry and they were healing themselves and the community around them. And we don't have pictures of that, but we have descriptions. And it would be great if we could create some visuals of that. You heard it first here. <laughs> Collaborative creative arts research, campus and community, we'll make it happen. Oh, this is great, thank you. I, um, when I think about uh, Dr. Clark Pajara's research and I think about you painting your daughter's story into the story of Wisconsin and I think about 100 years from now when another historian is doing research and pulling um, those images forward, uh, 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 what story? that we'll be telling. Please, I hope you have robust questions. Um, there are microphones set throughout the room for you to step up to. If you have a question, please step up to the microphone. I'll acknowledge you. As you do so, I'm gonna take a question from online, and I believe this question is um, to Jamalik of Madison Ballet, and maybe others can speak to it too. It asks about the barriers that you overcame to bring the board, and local supporters along with diversifying the company. And you spoke to it as if it's easy. Hmm? You know, go out, have a conversation, shake a hand. Um, but Christina also spoke to how difficult truly that work um, is. So what are some of the barriers that within your respective areas you may have faced in trying to do what you know deep down in your gut 
should truly be simple. Yeah, I mean, I went, I went to a, a performing arts school, um, a, a very small class, and I was one of maybe 30 dancers. I was not the most talented, trust and believe. Or at least to me, I wasn't. I mean, I was, but. <laughs> but they were extremely talented as well. Here, here lies the barrier. I had first the ambition, the drive to want to succeed in this industry. And I'm a Scorpio and I come from a very strong-willed mind family, so I inherited that naturally that I'm gonna do what I set out to do. But when you go beyond that, these other dancers that I grew up with, they face the barrier of not receiving the scholarship, not receiving the funding and the, the financial support to pursue this career. That is, and that is still a major barrier. Yes, I made light of it, but it is, the first connection is just going to the doors and shaking hands with people and knocking and starting the communication. Then comes the money, which, you know, it, it's always the next thing creeping its ugly head up. Um, is how are we gonna pay for this? How are we gonna fund this? And my thing is there, there's always a way. When I see the amount of money and research that I do into grants and things that are spent on what I was saying earlier, on programs that are profusely spouting diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion, but they're only having conversations. When are they ever gonna show the diversity? When are they ever gonna show the inclusion? I go after, when are they gonna do the work, right? I go after those companies, and I go after those funders to say, why are you giving your dollars there when there's an active organization here literally doing the work on pennies and dimes that could really use the funding to truly push this narrative forward. So that's the main barrier is always the money, of course, um, and the accessibility. Um, I'm looking right now as an artistic director of a ballet company, I am still asking the question, where are the black dancers? Where are the black ballerinas? Where are the black swans? And there was a moment in period where there were a robust amount of them. But what has happened is that these ballet companies have taken so long to catch up or to actually do the work that they've given up. They've moved on to the other industries, to the hip hop industry, the commercial industry, movie industry. A lot of them have become entrepreneurs of underwear lines and clothing lines and things like that, which is great, but I know they're like me. Because I, I took a break. I took a break and went into the fashion world, which has got its own problems. Um, but I took a break and, and I, I was dying in that because I know my passion, I know my art, I know my heart and my art is in ballet. So I came back to it, but everybody doesn't have that, you know? So it's, it's, it's really breaking down these barriers and, and, and going after these financial institutions that are frivolously funding organizations that are not doing the work for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's take a question from the room. Please introduce yourself and ask your question. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Xin Tui Daoling. I use she, her pronouns. I work in the math department. Um, thank you so much for your great work and sharing your work with us. I think one of the panelists, Christina, you, are in, you inspired um, this question because you mentioned the discomfort that you noticed uh, when the group people that you work with perform the arts. I was wondering for the other panelists, if you have been the discomfort when you perform of the work that you do or the arts that you perform, and have you ever need to adjust the work that you do uh, in order to have access to more space, to more resources? I have stories on stories. I think there is an answer that is movement-centric, you know? I, liter I literally can tell you, I went to the International uh, Association of Blacks and Dance Conference last year, and this is my first time as a, sitting there as an artistic director. I was on the other side for many years as a dancer, being you know, judged to get into a company and things like that. And sitting on the other side next to my other colleagues, <laughs> gather around children, I love the theater. <laughs> and all the charming people in it. You're too young to know what that is. Anyway, <laughs> I sat there on the other side of the panel as a person in a powerful position, and I could hear the conversations about the black dancers and the brown dancers in the room. That was the first time I had that. And I was blown away. This person's feet, not very good. This person lacks turnout. 
Meanwhile, I'm looking at the people that they're praising and I'm saying the same thing. I'm like, well, she don't have no feet either. He don't have no turnout, but you're going to take him. So I said, okay, that's fine. I'll show you. I hired the two black people that are in the photo that you saw, and they are killing it at Madison Ballet. So, you know, that, that, that's the thing for me. Is, and it's, it's weird. It was weird. It was almost like an outer body experience. Like I literally jumped out of my body and was sitting there in the dance floor and watching over at myself <laughs> in real time in this experience. And that was like really, really mind blowing, but that's just my experience in it. I, I think I make people uncomfortable all the time. Um, so like, oh, what do you do? I'm a historian. Oh, what do you study? Uh, early America, oh, what in early America? Slavery, and then people try to get away from me. <laughs> like, I'm gonna launch into a lecture or they expect me to be really angry or hostile. Um, because I'm telling stories from a lens they are not used to hearing those stories from. Um, but I think I'm able to, the vast majority of the time, convince people that it's a lens that they must understand because if they're not looking through all the lenses, they don't really understand what they're talking about. And kind of the primary example I'll give people just really quickly is, you know, if, if you only understand the American Revolution from the point of view of George Washington and Thomas and Jefferson, you understand a myth. If you don't understand what it meant from the point of view of Ona Judge, who was owned by Martha and Joan George Washington, you don't understand what fight for liberty and freedom actually means, right? That you have such a limited, obscure view and that when we are telling other stories, we are increasing our understanding of something, right? And that that is something that's really critical and it's not scary and that we should be uncomfortable because that's where we learn. Mm -hmm. um, my daughters in dance, and every time they get good at something, they make them do something else. Why? I played soccer growing up. As soon as we got good, you have to do something else. And I think that we need to do those same things when we're thinking about how we learn and how we get better at diversity in action, not just talking about things. Do the thing that makes you uncomfortable. <laughs> and then when you get comfortable with that, pick something else that makes you uncomfortable and do it again. Thank you. That's so one of my choices in life. We have to, thank you. We're going to take, we have to bring into relation, uh, into, into, into our focus or relationship with discomfort, our own discomfort, and what it says about where our privilege is sitting in that moment. Um, we're going to take two more questions from the room, and then um, I'll ask the panelists to respond, and then we'll wrap because um, we are at time. Question A, question B, thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Kinnitator. I use she, her pronouns. I am a therapist, mental health and addictions at UW Health. Um, so I appreciate all of the information today, especially with the arts, because I have an arts background in dance for years and years and years. Um, so thank you for being here, Jean-Malik. Um, specifically, just wanted to challenge all of you in the respect of as, as you were percolating Kiba and as you were like, hey, I could, I could partner with you, like my mind was like, you could partner with you and you and you all could partner with each other and make such a huge diversity like voice out there. Um, but specifically in that light, how can we all as a community help and back you in each of, each of the efforts you do? I used to work with kids with disabilities, so I understand that background, and I understand the dance background and the arts background, but how do we, as a community, back you up? Thank you. Thank you for that question, and we'll take another one. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sonia Spencer. I am over at the Center for Healthy Minds. I'm the Development Communication Specialist. Um, but I am here today to, first of all, thank you all for um, sharing your talents and your passion in this space and for also engaging all of our future artists. Um, I do have a quick comment, and then I do have a question, and my comment is to you, John Malik. I am a proud aunt of a black ballerina who has been dancing since the age of two, and now at 16, we, really, we literally believe she is going to be the next Misty Copeland. Um, she was also able to train with you this summer in Pennsylvania, and uh, she was the only black girl in that class. Um, and throughout the whole camp, she was probably one of the only 
maybe three or five black girls. So the experience that she had, not just to be a part of the camp and to receive the scholarship, but to also train with you, a black dancer, was very meaningful. So I wanted to make sure I came in this space and share that with you. And my next question is, um, seeing her progression through dance and seeing what her parents have done for her, you know, belonging in this season has been such a big talk of conversations. And especially with ballerinas and thinking about just the accessories that they have to uh, wear from shoes to tights to other, um, other items that they have to bring to the table. And my sister and her husband did such a great job in advocating for her, especially with her shoes, to make sure that they were of culturally appropriate for her. How can we, what needs to be done to encourage the dance studios to be more mindful to this? Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you both for your questions. So there are two questions um, on, that are on the table at the moment. Um, and I'm going to ask the panelists to just offer your final thoughts, choosing any one of those two questions. I suspect one is specifically to Jamalik um, to respond to. Thank you all. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, and um, I'll, I'd like to address the what can, can you all do. Um, I think that science is finally on our side. Okay. It, I've, I've been doing, uh, I've been in the arts for a very long time, and finally, science, data, medicine, it's all um, confirmed and validated what I have known and many of us you know, have known for a long time. The arts are good for you, right? It makes our life better. It makes our health better. It's, it helps. It, it, it's good. Arts are good. Um, so science has helped us, we as individuals know this, we need funders to help us do this good work, right? We also need to, to now convince people that, that people who are not going to be the next Misty Copelands, right, or, or um, be the top of their profession, um, do things professionally and make a living on it, that their experiences in the arts is worth investment, right? It's worthwhile to fund these programs. And the way that you can all help is to go to artsforallwi.org and sign up for our newsletter. Um, look at what we do and how we do it and see if if it's something that you want to invest in. And we are definitely working together on, um, on dance and adaptive dance programming. So we're in it. Yeah, quickly, um, thank you. Uh, to answer the first question, show up, especially to organizations, especially arts organizations that are actually doing the work like Madison Ballet. Um, if you look on the website of what we're doing, what I have done, I have truly diverse, diversified what we're present, representing on stage. We have Stephanie Martinez coming in the, in, the, in the winter, a Latin choreographer to share her experience because we have not had that in Madison. So I'm doing the work to make sure that everyone is being represented on stage. We have out programs that represent the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so I'm doing the work, but I am a little disappointed at the audience turnout. So I would love to have more of you come and see what we're actually doing. He saw the show and you will be transformed, I promise you. Um, the second answer, um, yes, I do know her very well. I was very honored to have been her teacher this summer. Um, the thing is, I make sure that each school, whatever school she goes to, has a parent community association and talk to, it, like at CPYB this summer, there were 300 kids there. She was one of four black kids out of 300. So that's, three, that's uh, 290, I'm bad at math, 297 white parents that went there. Talk to them, get them to change the school director because that's not our responsibility, it's theirs. Because we, we should not have to change who we are to fit into a cult, to an art form that they did not own. No one owned it. 
Ballet literally means dance. Dance came from the earth, came from people, and it's going to be always delivered back to the people. That's Alvin Ailey, not me. And you know what I'm saying. So you make them do the work on that account because it's, it's quite accessible now because all companies, all schools allow everyone to wear the tights that represent them. Real quick, um, show up. That was simplest um, for how you can help. Take down our names, right? Connect us with the people in your network who it makes sense for us to work with, right? There's a lot more of you out there than there is of us. We can do all the work we want to look out and try to find opportunities, but it's a lot easier on us and less taxing if we're approached with some of these opportunities. If you come and say, hey, I got this uh, opportunity for you, John Lee. Hey, I got this opportunity for you, Chrissy. I got this opportunity for Kiba. Take our information down, take our names down, connect us with your networks and, and talk about us in your circles. And if not just us, other people like us, but specifically us because we're on the panel right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also I challenge all of you to be creative. You know, a lot of people say that, oh, I'm not an artist, I don't do this. I, we're inherently creative people. It's some of the first things we do when we're growing up. I have two young children. They love to dance, they love to sing. They love to draw, you know, and I, and that, that's fantastic for me. We forget that as we get older. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself the opportunity, and I challenge you to be creative, and whatever that means, without repercussions. You don't have to be a professional dancer to enjoy dancing. You don't have to be great at singing to enjoy a good song. Right. You know, be, be, be creative. Thank you. Just really quickly, support the organizations that support good work. So... PBS, Wisconsin, uh, you know, uh, Humanities Council. Pay attention when, you know, the federal legislators or Congress is wanting to cut the budget of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts because these things matter. And these are some of the major funders of people like us who are interested in this work. Before I say thank you to our panelists, I just want to invite you all to join us at 1 p.m. this afternoon where Professor Mark H. in the First Wave community will present a creative arts workshop in relation to this very topic and conversation we had here this morning. Now, please help me thank this brilliant uh, panel this morning.